Good morning. So we are, uh, if you have your Bibles, grab them. We are in James, continuing on our series. And this, this morning we'll be in, starting in James chapter 3, the first half of that, uh, that chapter. And right off the bat, uh, I have to admit to you that, you know, there's times where I preach a passage that I know is going to be hard for others. This is one of those times where, as, as James begins, it's probably one of the scariest passages uh, in all of Scripture for me personally. Uh, as, as a pastor, and you'll see why right when we get to it. So we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on intro. We're just going to stand and dig right in uh, from, into God's Word. So if you would stand with me. Uh, if you, as a reminder, we'd like to stand when we read from the Word of the Lord uh, and, and, and distinguish that from the words that I speak to you. And so this morning, we will be in James 3, uh, verses 1 through 12. And it doesn't take you more than a verse to figure out why this passage scares me. So let's read together. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with a greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, also able to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire, and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives? Or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. It's the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. Have a seat. So James opens with this kind of intense warning for anyone who would set themselves out to to teach. And and when he says teach, he means to expound the word of of God. We're not talking about math teachers here. We're not talking about, you know, uh, preschool teachers. We're talking about anybody who would set out to, to take this book, to open it up, to read it, to seek to understand it, and then to, in some fashion, proclaim to others that which God says in their own words, to teach. And that's a, a warning that James throws out pretty harshly. It, it's, you know, and so obviously, the definition of, of teaching here is something that I do week in and week out, for sure. Right? We, wanna, we can look at like, what does it mean to teach and what does it encompass and not encompass. But at the very least, like, I don't get to get out of this one. right? Like you could argue for yourselves, maybe, and, and win an argument depending on whether you've ever taught a Sunday school class or whether you, you know, lead a Bible study or, or whatnot. But certainly, I can't get out of this one. Like at the very bare bones, this category does include me. And so when I read these verses, my ears perk up in nervousness and anxiety a little bit, right? And, yeah, and I was always a kid, like in school, I like to slip under the radar. Like I perfected the art, and there is an art, to making sure that the teacher never called on me when I was in school, right? And here, here's the key. Like, you ha- at the moment when the easy question comes, right? Like, you got, you got to get the easy ones in, and then you just fade into the background. You can't try to look like you're hiding because they're smart. They'll find that. They'll, they smell fear, right? But if you're just so right and you act just in the right way, you can slip under the radar. I like to be someone who slips under the radar. Now I'm told that by Scripture, I'm singled out for the profession that the Lord called me to do for a greater strictness and judgment than everybody else. Yay. Don't let, don't let anybody ever tell you that like, oh, pastors have all these perks. Yeah, but 
there's, uh, not really, right? There's some stuff there that we really don't, don't like. Well, the one who teaches God's word, why, why would there be this stricter judgment? It's because that person, just by definition of what they're doing, they don't have to have a Messiah complex. They don't have to think that they know things that others don't. They just, by the nature of getting up and opening this and reading it and saying this is what, what it says, right? You're, you're speaking for God. You're speaking on behalf of of God. And so when I stand up here, I'm, I'm claiming to say and explain that which God himself saith, right? I'm not saying that when I speak, it's as if God speaks, but I'm, I'm claiming to say the things of God to the people. And, and quite frankly, God does not take well to identity theft. And so when, when people get up and say things about God or say things that God says that are inaccurate, Right? That's something that he doesn't take very lightly. And quite frankly, if you're going to purport to speak for him, you better make sure that what you say is something that he himself has said. And, and as honest as I am, as much as this does terrify me, there is a lot of hope in a passage like this because we live in a, a world where false teaching is everywhere. You, can, you used to be able to say, I will walk into the walls of a church and I will hear God's word preached faithfully. Quite frankly, you really have to do your homework and research now if you're going to walk into the average church in America and the world today. Because there are many places where there is everything but the true gospel being preached. False teaching is everywhere. And, and for me, a passage like this provides hope in the sense that you know, we, we can say at least God is going to deal with this. Like, God is not okay with the prevalence of, of false teaching. When we say things about God in this world that are not real, and we purport to speak in his name that which is from Scripture, and we distort it, that is something that God gets really, really angry about. And so when I see false teaching, it's very easy to get frustrated, right? And I don't mean false teaching where a pastor gets up and he says something wrong once in a while because he, you know, he's human and he's fallible. I guarantee you I have said things somewhat wrong or inaccurate or not fully accurate from the pulpit to you over the years. And that's just part of the human nature, right? I am not God. And so I say wrong. But I'm talking about people who willfully twist the word of the Lord in order to gain, whether it's to gain money, to gain fame, to simply grow their church for the wrong reasons, right? Some people, even with good motives to make people feel good about themselves or joyful or happy, will say things from Scripture that are inaccurate and false. And it's really kind and encouraging in a way to know that God does not take that lightly, that he will deal with that in his time, in his way, when he desires to in judgment. But it's a harsh warning for us. And as much as I, I hated, like my ordination exams were the, some of the most grueling aspect of my life. I, I had to sleep for days afterwards to get, to get that off of me. Right? And, and I hated every minute of those exams, both written and oral. And if you aren't familiar with the process that our denomination goes through, it's pretty rigorous. It's not fun. And, and I look back at it now, and I, I, I'm glad for it for two reasons. One, sinfully selfish, because it's just nice to watch other people after me suffer whenever I go to presbyteries now and have to be one of the people that gets to examine. But also, it's because I know that the people that get up in our denomination to preach have been really thoroughly vetted. Like, there is something comforting about knowing that when I sit down with a brother or sister pastor in the EPC that, that I can know that, that when they preach God's word, they've, they've been taught and instructed and tested in the the, the careful, articulate, and true preaching of that word. Right? But James has no room for anyone who would seek to do falsely. And he says, look, if you're going to teach, then, then you're going to be judged more strictly. But when we start to drill into what teaching means here, we begin to notice a broader nature to these kinds of words. James's warning moves beyond myself and quite frankly, ex extends to really all who would call upon the name of, of Jesus. Because here's the reality. Teaching means to speak for God. And if that's the case, every one of you at some point or another has probably spoken for God to another person. Maybe you're not a teacher or a Sunday school leader or a Bible study leader, but, but you've gotten coffee with, with a dear friend who knows you're a follower of Christ and is seeking advice, and you've purported to speak for the things that God would say over their life. When you really think about it, to be a Christian means to be a teacher. Right? 
And while we set apart certain people in leadership to preach the word of God and worship on a regular basis, there, is really, there, there really are nothing but teachers in this room. And so this is a warning that extends to you as well. Right? Wherever you are, you may be teaching. By the way you live, knowing for people to know that you are a follower of Christ, you're teaching them about what it means to be a, a follower of Christ, right? You're teaching them something. A lot of times we teach people the whole wrong thing about Christ. There's a whole broad swath of people in this country who, based on the teachings of their Christian friends, would assume that God is, uh, you know, let's say, let's get weird with it. God is a Republican. I have news for you. God is not a Republican at all. It's not a Democrat either, right? And it's not, a, it's not a political point, but rather simply this. All Christians often speak about God in a manner that is teaching, and we purport to speak for him. And James is trying to get you to know and understand that every time you speak for God in any direct or indirect way, he takes that very, very seriously. And if we're honest... This is something we all struggle with profoundly. We love to talk. And I can, I can confess to you that a lot of times I have, have speech that comes out of me that I am not content with or proud of. And I think we would all say that that's true for us, right? It's a broad issue. If I would have people raise their hand of all, the, all those who are perfectly content with the way their speech pours forth and the things that they say, hmm, no one would raise their hand. And James knows that no one would raise their hand. That's why he moves into the next segment. He understands this well. For all of us, for all, stumble in many ways. And if anyone doesn't stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man. Right? James says, look, if, if, if any one of you theoretically could have speech that is perfectly under control, that would make you a perfect man or woman. Anyone who could control their speech perfectly, just the, the natural outflow of that would be that they would control their body perfectly too. In other words, if you had controlled speech to a perfect degree, you would be sinless. And as we know, there was only one ever sinless person to walk the earth, and that is Jesus Christ himself. Right? And he, he's saying, look, if someone could control that speech, they would be blameless, but it's just not a possible thing. This is one of those beautiful sermons where I'm never talking to one or two people in the room who feel convicted. This ought to be, every one of you ought to come up to me after church and go, you wrote that for me, didn't you? It still happens every week. I promise you, I did not write a sermon ever in this church for any individual human being. But today is one of those where we should all feel it because we all stink at controlling our speech. It's something that's just naturally part of the sinful world in which we live. This little verse is so important as we move into the meat of this passage. It's so important to understand that our speech is something we cannot control with any kind of degree of ability. We can't do it. We can't control our speech. And, and the reason this matters is because we're going to start to talk about the tongue here. And when we talk about the tongue in James 3, every sermon I've ever heard where you talk about the tongue, the, the takeaway becomes people going home and trying to, to, to work hard to resolve it. I'm going to go home and work on my speech. And that's, that's not bad. That's a good thing, as we'll get to a little later. But quite frankly, James here makes it clear from the outset that that's not a resolution. You cannot control your speech. Right? The answer to hearing about the tongue and the power of the tongue that we're digging into today cannot be, I will go home and I will try to work on how I speak to people by itself. Because what James is saying is the tongue cannot be tamed. It cannot be tamed. It is something that cannot be controlled. Every man who has ever lived, every woman who has ever lived and will ever live and does live today has issues controlling their tongue, their speech, the way that they talk about others, to others, about God, even to God himself. Everything about your speech is, is stained by sinfulness in a way that you cannot dig your way out of. And so the solution cannot be to go home and work harder. I want to say that from the outset because that's the temptation we face when we hear things like this, when we read through passages like this. It's just not possible to do. And so James moves from this kind of warning against false speech, especially as it relates to God, to talking about this tongue. 
He gets into a detailed discussion about the tongue, and he starts with these kind of analogies that, that give us a sense for the power that our tongue, our speech, truly has. The first thing he says is that the, the tongue is kind of like the, the, the bite of a horse. Right? You have this, a horse is this pure animal of raw power, this immensely powerful animal that, you know, we, we literally have units of measurement of power that we have named after the animal horse. Like when you get your car, you ask, how many horsepower does it have? Right? It's, it's an animal of pure muscle, and I've seen six-year-olds control it with, with some rope and a bit in the mouth of the horse. Easily, right? With the right skill and the right mindset, it's, it's easy to tame. It's to steer it with this little tiny thing this massive animal. And then he, he gets into the idea of the rudder of a ship and even the greatest ship on earth. Today we'd be talking about the cargo ships that you know, block the Suez Canal because the, the rudder didn't work. But they say it's steered by a rudder that you know, while standing next to you is probably huge, compared to the vessel it's steering is tiny and minuscule. So this miniature thing has complete control over this massive thing. And so in the same way, the tongue is just like this. It has immense, incomprehensible power relative to the tiny size that it takes up within our body. And then he gives this final analogy of a, a forest fire set ablaze by a tiny fire. Right? When you, when you, you know, my wife and I went to honeymoon in California, and we drove through some places that had been devastated by wildfires that year. And, and one of the things you learn is it's like most of these fires that burn thousands and thousands of acres were started by one dumb guy making a campfire where he shouldn't have, just by a spark. But a year or so ago, I remember there was a, a couple on the news that tried to do something really creative for a gender reveal party, and they set like a whole forest on fire, right? and they were being sued for it. The tiniest little spark can ignite a massive fire. And his point is clear. The tongue is tiny, minuscule, insignificant, but it is the most powerful organ that you possess in your body. And so the, the first thing James wants us to understand is just how powerful the tongue is. Whatever damage you think your words have the capacity to inflict, times it by a thousand or more. You have done more damage with your speech in your lifetime than you will ever know or understand. Try as you may. And so, then what does mankind do with this immensely forceful tool that they have at their disposal? We have this massive weapon at our arsenal. What have we done with it? And James suggests in his second point that the tongue is, is kind of an absolute full evil. James does not have a high view of the tongue. And that becomes really obvious when we just continue reading a little bit. Right? Every, every, every bird, reptile, sea creature has been tamed by it, but no being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in heaven. From the same mouth comes blessing and cursing. And a little earlier, the tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body. It sets on fire the whole course of life, and is set itself on fire by hell. I don't think James is trying to be melodramatic here. I actually think James is being more literal than he's being in most of the rest of his work here. James's argument is the tongue of man is kind of like Satan's gateway to the world. It's a direct line to and from the pit of hell, our tongues, according to James. It's the conduit through which the enemy conducts his work in this world. And it's an immensely effective tool that the enemy likes to use. Think of the damage that the tongue has done in the world in which we live. Wars have been started. Relationships have been severed. There are many of you in this room who have relationships that have been broken by a, by a single sentence spoken. There are people that you haven't communicated with in decades because of a few words that were said. Right. And so James argues, number one, that the tongue is immensely powerful. But beyond that, he argues that the tongue generally is, is the most evil thing that we have in this world. It is, it is Satan's conduit to do damage. And boy, does he use it. Right? And so, I don't know about you, but that's a deeply humbling and troublesome statement for me to hear. Because our tongues are the number one tool the enemy uses to conduct 
business. Satan uses your tongue, my tongue, to divide, to deceive, to initiate violence. He uses it to cause people to question themselves or God. He uses it to destroy relationships, to manipulate people from God's truth and goodness. And so James rightfully calls it a restless evil full of deadly poison. And he reiterates that man has seemed to be able to tame everything else under the sun, every animal, the field, every beast in the air or in the sea. We've conquered this world, but we seem to be unable to conquer this little tiny thing of muscle that lives inside of us. We haven't been able to tame that. Lions, tigers, no problem. Right? But the tongue, it eludes us. It's never been tamed by anyone. And that's really, really sobering to come to grips with. I, I realize you know, this thing we possess, which has so much power, it can cause so much evil for us. It's something we probably give way less thought to than we ought to. Sure, we, we think about our speech, and we, we try to choose our words carefully, and we learn as we grow up that we should, you know, we should only say something if we have something nice to say, or we should say nothing at all. But, but in general, we don't tend to spend a whole lot of time thinking about the level to which our tongue can cause damage in this world, and the way our words can be perceived, and what they can or can't do to another person, both in the positive and the negative realm. We tend to just say things, and say them quickly, right, without much thought. Think of what percentage of your speech is, is well thought out versus you just talking. Right? How much of our speech is carefully planned relative to this unbelievable power that it yields? If we're honest with ourselves, we act as if we have two mouths and half an ear. Right? And for James, this is a, a big deal. For, for, for one really important reason, and something that repeats itself a lot in James. Uh, sometimes James is too kind of uh, right-brained for his own good, and so his argument is simply this. This kind of conduct in speech, the way that we use our tongues, is incongruent with the renewed heart that has been changed by Christ. He says the, the same mouth blesses God and then curses those made in his likeness. That ought to not be this way. Because how, how can you praise the Lord with a tongue and then look at a person who God has made in his image, regardless of what you might think about them, regardless of how awful of a human they might be, how can you curse something that he's made? How can you say, Lord, be blessed, you're perfect, you're, you're wonderful, you're holy, but, but this thing you've made is garbage. How can we do that? How can we, how can we bless with, with one, one, one side the Lord and then turn around and use that same mouth to curse the, the creation that he has given us, that he has made in his holiness and in his infinite wisdom? And, and James is just so matter of fact, well, that's incongruent. That doesn't make any sense. Right? And we know the world sometimes isn't that black and white, but for James, it is. He says the same mouth can't bless God and curse others. It doesn't make sense. We can't sing praises to our Father, calling him a perfect creator, and then curse that which he lovingly created. And then he closes with a, a couple of nature analogies that kind of drive home just how incongruent it is. He says, look, uh, a fig tree can't produce grapes. A grapevine can't produce figs. It doesn't make any sense. The tongue set towards Christ ought not to produce Satan's speech. If we are made new in the image of God, then how is it that our tongue seems to have missed the appointment? It doesn't add up. It's incongruent with what our new identity in Christ is. And to have the most powerful organ of our body rudder us against the current of Jesus just doesn't make sense to James. So he goes, look, and this is James's argument with really a lot of things in the book. He says, look, I, the issue is that your, your mind doesn't match your heart. That which your mind thinks about Jesus, your heart isn't actually doing, feeling, right? There's, there's a barrier right here that, that takes us from our brain to our heart and our hands and our feet somehow. We, we, we say we have this newness, but it doesn't seem like that's how it is. And that's how James concludes. He kind of leaves us sitting in it. And I think that's intentional. Sometimes James finishes things seemingly abrupt, and it's a letter that continues, and I get that, and we'll pick up in 3.13 next week when we continue on and finish that, the chapter, and we'll talk about wisdom and some things that play into this. But in the midst of this paragraph, James just kind of lets us sit in it. He goes, look, I just, I just want you to know that, 
that the way you conduct yourself with your speech, it's just incongruent with your identity as a follower of Christ. Just sit in that and think about it. It doesn't match up. And you need to understand just how much your negative speech doesn't add up. Because if you are made new in Christ, that includes the way that you talk about him, about you, about others, about those you love, about those you hate. It informs that speech. It means you don't get to say certain things. I was having a conversation a couple days ago, and one of the things that we kind of hit on with, with elders is that I think, you know, we, we live in a country that really pushes and values free speech. And we're very, very up in arms about the reality that the government ought not to impede in any way our free speech. And whenever the government tries to do something to seemingly suggest that it might impede our speech, we get real up in arms about it, as we should, because I, I believe firmly that no government on earth has the right to, in any way, tell me what I can or can't say. However, Scripture, the Word of God, God himself, he gets to restrict your speech all he wants. Right? The Christian does not have free speech fully. The government can't tell you what to say or not say, but God certainly can and does and should, and, and he does here. Right? And so our speech is restricted. You cannot and should not be allowed to say the things which you might want to say in certain contexts. God calls you, commands you at times to shut it or to say things which you don't want to say. Right? There are times where the Lord calls you to speak in ways that you might not want to, but he's saying, no, you need to. You need to go tell the people about who I am and what I've done and what I can do for them and how I love them. And, and you might need to have a harsh word with somebody in the name of, of the Lord because it's a fellow Christian that's moving in a path that they shouldn't. And you, I know you want to be loving, but you've you got to say something because your speech, if, I am, if you are in me, is, is controlled by me, and I get to dictate it. And so our speech is not free as brothers and sisters of Christ. Hard as that may be to swallow. We should go home and feel a bit defeated after this. Because the reality is that we, we don't want our tongues to function this way. right? No one here gets up in the morning and says, how can I use my tongue to, to commit evil in this world? How can I say something to so-and-so in church that I know is, is just going to cut them down and when they go home, it's just going to stew in their minds and, and rip apart the identity of who they are, right? How can I say just, none, none of us think that way, hopefully. If you do, please go to another church, right? <laughs> please. Right. We love you. God loves you, but go. Right. But most, that, we don't think that way. We don't get up in the morning trying to allow our, our tongue to be Satan's instrument, that's not how we think. Most of us don't get up and think that way. It just kind of happens. The rudder that is our tongue tends to steer the rest of our body off course as the day goes along. Most of the time we say evil, we don't mean to say evil. It just kind of comes out. It comes out in anger. It comes out in times of fatigue or frustration at another person or even at ourselves. Right? That's just how speech works. And that should leave us kind of sad, discontented, and perplexed a bit. And we should mourn that, really. We should long for a different heart, in a way. Right? And, and, and the point that you know, we were trying to make early on here, when, when James says, look, all of us are in this same boat, is that the next step is we usually try to resolve it. We try to work on it. You know, you feel guilty about the way that you've talked to so-and-so on Thursday. And here's Pastor Vince giving you a sermon that kind of kicks you in the teeth. And so, I need to go home make restoration. And those are good things. You should work to improve your speech. Right? There's nothing wrong with that. But we can't think that that's how it works fully. We all go home and think about the way we, we talk and slander and gossip and manipulate, and we just hope and, and resolve it somehow by sheer force of will. James has made it evident that all of us need to do this. All of us need to get on our knees and we get to pray. Right? We need to get on our knees and we need to pray and we need to ask the Lord to change our speech. You cannot fix your tongue by sheer force of will and exercise and forming of habits. You need Jesus to renew your heart and your mind. 
daily. You need to get down on your knees and pray that the Holy Spirit would guide you towards a desire for, for better speech. That he would want you to speak life more than death and that he would move within you to do that. You need to seek the Lord to move in your heart each and every day and you need to ask the Lord as you awake in the morning to work through you on your speech that day to allow his power to be the thing that compels you to change and to shift. Because you cannot do it. I don't care how good at habit forming you are. I don't care how disciplined you are. Not a human in this room is able to actually control or shift their speech as a result of hearing a guilt sermon. You need Jesus. You need the Spirit to come and invade your heart and to change you slowly over time. And that's really why James says this ought not be so. He's saying, look, the way that our speech changes is when Christ inhabits us and renews us day by day. When each morning when we arise, we're more and more in his word and we, we consume more and more of his speech and see the way that he speaks to others and how he seems to treat those. Not sure what that was. It sounded like the thing that happens before a fire alarm, so I was waiting for the... Yeah. But, that, but that's what we do. We allow the Lord to come in and we plead with God each and every day to renew our hearts and minds until the day where our speech continues to move closer and closer to the way that Jesus would talk. And we pray that we get to see the people who we have issues with in the light that Jesus sees them in. As sinners in the sight of God whom he wants to love and reconcile. I used to operate a lot more confrontationally, especially towards people who didn't believe the same thing I believed. I used to have a, a far more abrasive speech. I used to be far more worried about when things were said about God that were false in this world, like I had to somehow be the guy that came in and course corrected everything. And I swear, the longer I go, the more it seems like the Lord is giving me a peace over all of that. Every year that goes by, I feel like I want to be less and less confrontational and more and more trusting that the Lord's got it under control. The Lord seems to continue to give me a deeper and deeper trust that those things will just kind of work himself out in his timing. And so the longer I do this, the less I, I want to desire to win the Christian argument and confrontation, and the more I kind of seem to want to desire to win the person that I'm talking to. Right? As we continue to grow more and more, into what, what God has for us in our life. As we continue to trust him more and, and experience more of his deep abiding peace, one of the natural outpourings of that is that our speech is affected by it. We start to feel the need to talk less and to talk more intentionally because we don't have to say it all because we serve a God who's in control. Right? And that truth and that reality is what ends up guiding us towards a, a tongue that is more glorifying and edifying of the Lord, not because we picked ourselves up and we tried hard, not because we put a swear jar in our house and watch it fill up towards a vacation fund. It was one of my favorite commercials ever. I think it was for like Bud Light or something. They had like a swear jar in the office. And they said like, well, when it's full, what do you do with it? Well, we, we buy a bunch of Bud Light for the office. And so all of them start cussing and putting money in the drawer. So it fills faster so that they can have a Bud Light party, right? Like, I think when we try to, to affect our speech just by sheer will, it's kind of like that. We, we try to, to make changes, but then they just don't seem to work. And we find ourselves in the same boat over and over and over again. The Lord is the one who will inhabit your hearts and change through it your tongue. And so my prayer for us is that as we go home, we would just seek the Lord. Ask the Lord to work on your speech for you. To point out to you the ways in which you've not edified and glorified, but instead torn down and sowed division. And, and don't go home guilt-ridden, but go home encouraged that you serve a God who can do something as, as crazy as tame your tongue. Because you can't, but he can. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Lord, you have tamed the untamable. There are two things in this world that it seems like we have not been able to tame, and that is the enemy and our tongue. And Lord, you are in control of both. You have squashed Satan under your feet. 
And you have promised a time where he will be defeated once and for all. A time where our mouths are no longer going to be permitted to be used for his evil. And Lord, we long for that. Father, we confess that we are sorry for the way in which we speak. And we seek forgiveness for those who we've wronged, even this past week, with the words that we've chosen. We pray that you would continue to renew our hearts and minds and that we might just surrender our tongue to you. We pray that you would continue to work on it. As slowly as we grow, that you would continue to refine the way that we see others and speak about them and speak about you. We pray for the hard conversations that we have to have on occasion, that you would be in the midst of them and go ahead of us. That when we have to say harsh things lovingly to other people, that we would choose words carefully and wisely and under your guidance and prudence and care. We pray that our speech would pour forth the gospel, that as we leave from this place, anyone we encounter would come to know you, which is why you gave us mouths in the first place. We love you, we praise you, and all his people said, amen.